you know, generally speaking, if you get a pretty diverse diet, you're going to get 99% of the necessary vitamins and minerals just from your diet. And when I say diverse, I'm really first and foremost talking about getting sufficient protein from a broad range of animal-based sources. They're the most nutrient dense, they're the most highly bioavailable. Today, we're here with our buddy, Stan Efferding. Uh, we first came across Stan. He actually attended one of the seminars with Ripito, and um, the whole staff was impressed by Stan, because n not just because he, he deadlifted 585 for a pretty easy set of five, <laughs> but because he came as a student. You know, Stan is a humble guy, he's a gentleman, so he was there to learn. And um, he's one of the most accomplished guys in, in a lot of the sports that, that touch what we do here. I mean, he's... Uh, a gigantic bodybuilder, as you can see, but he's also extraordinarily strong. So, Stan, you're you're one of the the few people that's ever totaled. What is it from my notes here? Twenty three hundred pounds raw. Is that right? Yeah, that used to be a big deal. Nowadays, we've got all these super heavyweights uh, doing that every weekend. But uh, certainly, the only guy over forty years old to have ever done it. But back when I did it in two thousand ten or two thousand twelve or whenever it was. Uh, there was only about a dozen of us that had hit that number at the time. Yeah, awesome, man. And I, I was kind of curious, what are your what are your stats? So would you mind sharing your height, body weight, body fat percentage, that kind of thing nowadays? Yeah, nowadays I kind of stay, well, it depends. In the winter time, I kind of fatten up to 250 and, and uh, uh, try and lift a little heavier. I use that as my gain season. And then most of the spring and summer, since I'm in Vegas, it's a long season of sun. I usually stick around to four years old now. So I've got no business being too heavy or too fat anymore. So I stick around 235. I'm just trying to take off some of my winter fluff right now. I'm down to about 245. And, uh, I, you know, generally speaking, I stay pretty lean. That's kind of been one of the things that uh, since I was a small, skinny kid, uh, gaining, it was always the hard part. Leaning out was never all that difficult. And uh, so I struggle with putting on mass. And so I, I keep myself around, you know, somewhere under 12% generally year round. And uh, probably summertime comes, I'll be closer to eight or nine. Well, yes, yeah, Stan, with that in mind, uh, as you know, the starting strength program is a way to rapidly gain size and strength. And uh, along with that comes weight gain. So our target audience is primarily middle-aged men. And I know there are a bunch of men out there that um, once they get through the novice linear progression where really just, just gain the weight, get bigger, get stronger, um, after that point, a lot of men, myself included, are interested in staying lean uh, or, or you know being as lean as possible um, within reason. So for me, it's different standards than, than the bodybuilding world for sure, but I like to be around 20% body fat. For me, that, that works great. Um, I can still have a lifestyle that's enjoyable, can eat uh, pretty flexibly. But um, for, for the middle-aged man that's gone through the process of getting much stronger very quickly and is interested in still getting stronger but wants to bias the weight gain towards muscle, do you have any general advice? And, and by the way, for those of you that haven't read the book, uh, The Vertical Diet, you should pick it up. The, the full detail will be in here, but we'll get the summary from Stan today. And the Starting Strength book, you pick hey. that one up too. Nice. <laughs> So yeah, Stan, I'd love uh, I'd love any thoughts from you on if um, if this middle aged guy that's just gone through the novice linear progression, he still wants to keep getting stronger, but wants to to bias the weight gain towards muscle. What what general advice do you have for a person like that? Well, I think we want to do that in phases. I think that uh, we should know by now that it's a lot easier to gain size and strength than a calorie surplus. Uh, one of the things that you should endeavor to do when you're gaining mass is not be in too much of a surplus because then you're going to gain more fat than is necessary. A small calorie surplus, 500, 600 calories, 
is sufficient to fuel all of the muscle growth that, uh, that you're stimulating with your training. The body is not going to add muscle any faster if you eat a 1,000 or 1,500 calorie surplus. It's just going to add fat with the muscle. And so I would caution people against trying to pound down too many calories to begin with. That's, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. If, if we just don't add all that excess body fat, and trust me, I've done it many times uh, since as early back in the late 80s and early 90s. I first hit 300 pounds in 1994. And I was 140 pounds in 1985 when I got to college. So wow. uh, I'm, I'm a perpetual bulker and dieter. I've been doing it for over 35 years. I've probably gained and lost well over 1,000 pounds, albeit intentionally, throughout my career, both bulking to power lift and cutting to bodybuild. Uh, so I, I learned a lot of lessons along the way, which is uh, part of what I incorporated into my book. And on the bulking side, I learned that these – uh, these uh, dirty bulk diets uh, are going to set you back. You're going to gain too much fat. Uh, the downside of that, obviously, you know, is that appearance wise, you're going to lose your six pack. Uh, but also, you know, physiologically, you're going to end up with metabolic syndrome, which I see in a lot of my heavy strong men and powerlifters. Uh, you're going to get fatty liver. You're going to have elevated blood pressure. Uh, you're going to have increased uh, uh, blood sugars. The kinds of things, obviously lipids, uh, the kinds of things that you kind of want to avoid. And so I would suggest not gaining too much weight to begin with. Having said that, uh, even being in a calorie surplus and gaining size, you're going to gain a little bit of fat. And ideally, you should uh, not be so close to uh, a lean body mass that it's going to compromise your gains. And it's, uh, uh, I don't expect you know, people to get to, to stay in, in uh, you know, under 15% when they're really trying to maximize their strength. Um, and so uh, once you get a calorie surplus, and you gained a significant amount of muscle and strength, and you kind of want to, now maybe you're north of 20% and you want to get back down to 15. A um, couple things to suggest, uh, obviously you're going to have to create a calorie deficit. During that time, you're probably not going to recover as well in a deficit that you did in a surplus. And so I tend to be cautious about how much fatigue I create. Uh, so I might not train as heavy as frequently and do as much uh, axial loading, uh, such as heavy squats, as often. I still do them, but I might throw in more 8 to 12 rep range stuff. I might use some more less fatiguing movements such as uh, uh, isolation in some body parts uh, and just kind of augment my training with that. Maybe alternate a heavy day with a lighter day. Uh, both are within you know, two or three reps of failure, but one is 85% loads and the other one's you know, 50 to 70% loads. Mm -hmm. So I try and decrease the fatigue. I try and decrease the calories. I might increase my activity some, and most of that would come from increasing my uh, my step count throughout the day, as opposed to deliberate cardio, because I think there potentially can be some competing uh, interference effects, uh, you know, a competing stimulus. Uh, although if you separate that cardio from your training by at least, you know, four to six hours or ideally a separate day, uh, probably not a big deal. But uh, I, I just, I prefer to get my cardio from my, my actual lifting, to be honest with you, and then just use the low intensity stuff, the the four 10 minute walks a day after meals uh, and just staying on my feet more. One of the things that we tend to do as power lifters is we, we tend to not run if we can walk, not stand if we can sit, not stay awake if we can sleep. And unfortunately uh, that's going to drive your total calorie, your non-exercise activity thermogenesis down for the day. And you're going to want to uh, just kind of be on your feet and move around and stay active. That, that goes a great way to burning uh, a significant amount of calories every day, more so than exercise activity, to be honest. Um, and so those are kind of my strategies. I keep my protein a little bit higher. I might go from, you know, when you're gaining weight, sometimes it's hard to eat. Uh, it, it's better to not to bring your protein down just a little because it's so satiating and you need to be able to eat more calories to stay in a surplus. So I might bring my protein down to say 0.8 grams per pound whenever I'm in a surplus. 
because uh, you know carbohydrates are protein spinning and as is a calorie surplus it's just not necessary to be that high in in, in protein so now when i'm in a calorie deficit and i want to increase my um, satiety so i'm not hungry all the time uh, and increase my thermic effect of food um, then i'll take protein up to 1.2 grams per pound and uh, generally speaking, I keep my fats around 25 to 35% uh, just for health reasons, whether I'm gaining or uh, dieting. And then my carbs is the rest. And I just adjust those um, based on my demands. If I'm in a surplus, then I throw in more carbs. If I'm in a deficit, I'll, I'll take out a few carbs. And I might time them around workouts so the workouts don't suffer, uh, but eat, a, eat fewer on a day off uh, or... Uh, you know, further from the workout, and I put 60 or plus percent of my carbs around the workout. And that, uh, other than that, uh, I might turn at least one, uh, I would at least one leg day a week, maybe two, into a pretty high intensity workout. I really love the benefit of, of just in shortening the rest periods, increasing the volume and frequency and repetitions, uh, and just making it a, a 35, 40 minutes of deep water. Um, you don't need to do that more than twice a week. It could be pretty fatiguing. But just by shortening the rest periods and increasing the repetitions and increase the total number of sets that you do, sets and reps, um, it's it's a really incredible workout. You just find that, uh, uh, that your body uh, tends to respond pretty well. You know, you breathe out uh, fat as it is. It's carbon dioxide, and you actually exhale it. And that's not to say that hyperventilating is going to burn fat, but certainly – increasing your workload in a given workout is going to have uh, effects on not just liberating fatty acids from storage, but then uh, burning them during training. So uh, I do like to, you know, as I mentioned, I don't, I don't like to do any extra cardio per se, but I really like to increase the intensity of at least a couple significant workouts a week. So I change quite a few variables, as you noticed. Yeah, I got to thank you, by the way, for your walking tip. That's been a great one for my wife and I. We're uh, walking after meals, and it's just a, a damn nice way to connect. And, you know, um, just strength training and then being sedentary for the rest of the time I don't think is ideal. Um, getting off your ass and moving around is, is crucial. So, And it's tough. It's like, well, do I go to a, a class? Do I, you know, just take long walks? And your idea just to take short walks after each meal. Like, I just, I just feel better after every meal, have more energy. It's a, it's a damn good habit to make. So we, I've been recommending that lately. I also, yeah. um, I also certainly agree with your suggestion on orienting meals around protein, obviously, right? We're trying to gain muscle here. We're trying to get stronger. Um, I think that's a damn good suggestion. So, you know, when I'm giving people advice in the gym on how to uh, orient their nutrition, the first thing I do is I give them a protein goal and that's it. So go hit your protein goal, step one, and then come back and we can make adjustments from there. So there's some really good tips in your book about how to get adequate protein. Um, when it comes to weight gain, so for our audience, you know, we're all about strength. Um, our body fat percentage is going to be a little bit higher than what a bodybuilder would have, obviously. But I just want to be clear in our position on this. So um, for those watching, you know, as a guy, we don't want you at 30% body fat, right? Um, we want you to be strong, but we also want you to be healthy. By the same token, we don't necessarily want you in kind of mid to low teens necessarily, because that might reduce the speed at which you can gain strength. We want you to get as strong as possible, as quickly as possible. Um, and what Stan said about gaining too much weight certainly applies depending on your situation. But for example, if you're a six foot tall, 17 year old kid, like one of the guys I'm coaching online, and you weigh 140 pounds, um, I don't care what weight you gain, you just need to gain weight, right? So um, gain 20 pounds immediately before we talk again next. And then after that gain like four pounds a week, and then we can dial in your body count from there. But just in the meanwhile, you're not going to be able to move anything reasonable, make any progress until you gain some damn weight. Um, Stan, anything you'd add to that? Or is that relatively aligned with where you're at too? No, and you finished off on something that's huge. A lot of times you'll get parents come in and they want to focus on uh, acceleration or, or change of direction or uh, you know a whole host of other variables if their kid wants to play football, et cetera. And the fact is, if you're undersized, then that becomes the single most important thing you can do. Rather than designing some complex program, I say, um, you know, a lot of dads, they want to do a, a whole lot of, or a little bit of everything, but a, a whole lot of nothing. And at the end of the day, a kid's just got to put on 30 pounds if he really wants to compete in high school. 
uh, in sports. That's just, the foundation is strength. The foundation of everything is strength. The foundation of speed is strength. The foundation of, of your broad jump, your, your, um, uh, your plyos, uh, change of direction is, is strength at its, at its very core. And so you just have to get bigger and stronger in order to get faster and, and more athletic. I'll give you some tips that I use with the world's strongest men and, and my powerlifters and even uh, a lot in football, like Lane Johnson for the Philadelphia Eagles, to make things easier. Because you said something important. Uh, compliance is the most important aspect. Compliance is the science. It's the quote I put in my book. And you can tell people you got to gain weight and eat more calories. But now how do they implement that effectively? You need something that, that kind of helps you, some guidance that makes that easier. Hofthor Bjornsson and Brian Shaw, when I worked with them, uh, they had to eat almost 10,000 calories a day. And they're going to do that, whether it's easy or it's hard. They're just going to do it because those kind of people that those, those guys are. And it can be exhausting. It can be harder than training. There's a question about it. The requirement to consume enough calories so that you're not losing size or strength. Uh, they've created this, what I call, they've become a victim of their own circumstance. They, they've, they've created this... Uh, it's almost a, a, a prison sentence of sorts. If they don't train and eat and sleep uh, sufficiently, they've created a, um, a body that demands all of those things in a certain minimum, has a certain minimum expectation before it's going to regress. So what I try to do, what I do with myself from learning from half dirty bolt, et cetera, uh, and then later uh, came up with some better techniques is just to, to make that process easier so you have less stress about it. And so here's what I do. I mentioned I reduce my protein a little bit, and I think that, that people mistakenly assume that when they're bulking that they need to eat you know two grams of protein per pound, but in fact, you can eat less. So 0.8 grams for protein, and again, that's for satiety, uh, that allows you to be, to be hungrier uh, and has less thermic effect of food. So if you eat 100 calories of protein, you're gonna net out 70. So that's not the go-to for weight gain because you're going to yield fewer calories uh, than you consume. Um, and so and I'm going to get sufficient fats in, as mentioned, about 25 to 35% of the total diet. Now I use carbohydrates to fill the gap. So uh, some other tricks that I'll use is uh, uh, I'll use what I have coined as the monster mash. I'll use ground beef, some scrambled eggs, some white rice, and some bone broth. And I blend it all up into a mash. And you know, you can use as much bone broth as you as you prefer for the consistency that you enjoy, whether it's soupy or just moist. But now, just mechanically speaking, you can eat a larger portion of that, be able to swallow it without choking on your food. Uh, and then it digests faster than say with a steak, um, because it's uh, has more ground beef has more surface area. So you can you can consume a lot of that in a short period of time and then be hungry again sooner. And so that's kind of my go-to. Uh, also with respect to white rice, I have those athletes sprinkle dextrose on it. Uh, anybody who's ever had sushi rice knows you can eat a ton of it and you're hungry again very shortly thereafter. Mm -hmm. The dextrose helps again mechanically with increasing amylase, uh, you know, the, the digestive enzyme for carbohydrates in the mouth, plus just saliva. So you can eat a larger portion of it without having to choke it down. Uh, but then physiologically, again, I mentioned the amylase in the mouth, but also the pancreatic amylase will help increase your ability to digest the starch. So I'm not using the dextrose per se to, to, to drive calories, but to uh, improve your ability to eat more of it and digest it faster. Now, the difference between a 4,000 calorie diet and a 5,000 calorie diet is three cups of rice. Hmm. That is it. Can you put that down? Uh, you know, you, and again, you could also throw in 10 ounces of whole milk with each meal. We've talked a lot about the GOMAD in the past that I certainly have, have uh, drank, you know, many gallons of milk throughout my career. Uh, and there's no, there's no real downside to that, but that it's a little higher in fat uh, when you're in a surplus. You might want to go to a 2%, but drinking your calories certainly benefits for bulking. Um, so those are some strategies that I use. I do keep fibers to a minimum to gain weight because I tend to fill you up, but I'll use fruit. Uh, I also use fruit juice, uh, just three ounces of orange juice with maybe split half and half with ice water really helps uh, appetite. I found it to be very helpful for appetite. Um, and then, you know, about an hour after I've eaten, I, I have a, a video on YouTube called 14 Tips to Increase Appetite. And uh, it's for those winter bulks for the gain season. 
and on there I mentioned that about uh, two hours or an hour or two after you've eaten, eat one Dorito, just one. And I, I'm telling you, an hour later, you will be ravishingly hungry from that, just that one Dorito, it just sending the signal to your body. It's, uh, I think umami is the, uh, is the taste. Um, but I posted that video and, and Hawthorne texted me right after and said, okay, I ate my bag of Doritos. Now what? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's proportional. If I get one chip, it gets a whole bag, right? <laughs> yeah. And lastly, I want to say in terms of making uh, all this happen for say a high school athlete in particular or busy individual, I've been promoting that thermos and I don't own it. It uh, you get it for $20 on Amazon. It's a 24 ounce double insulated thermos. Walmart sells them too. I don't leave the house without a hot meal or two or five if I'm flying a long ways. When I went to Moscow, it was a 20 plus hour day between layovers and, uh, and customs. I put five hot monster mash in five separate uh, stainless steel thermos and I put them in my carry on bag that I put under my seat. Every three or four hours, I was eating. 800 calories of monster mash while everybody else was foraging for nuts and chips on the plane. I didn't miss a single meal. I also uh, checked into check baggage, a rolling Coleman cooler that had 30 frozen meal prep meals in it. The ones that, that I make at the vertical diet, uh, dot com, which is my meal prep company are certainly convenient, but you, I used to make them myself. I would just get little Tupperwares, I would make a ton of monster mash, and I would freeze it the night before. And that morning when I got on the plane, I would have as many of those as, I, as would be under 50 pounds. And I would haul around 50 pounds of food whenever I leave the house for more than, say, four or five or seven days. I just went to Hawaii for a week last month. And I took a rolling Coleman with 50 pounds of prep meals so that when I got there, I stayed at a place with a microwave and a fridge, obviously. And I had most of my meals prepared. I didn't miss a single meal. Uh, on that trip or on, you know, when I travel internationally, I've been in 14 countries in all 50 states in the last four years. And I haven't missed a single meal because I plan ahead. And that thermos has been life changing for me uh, just because I, I'm able to, to it keep stays hot for at least 12, maybe 14 hours if you put it in there really hot. And so I mean, what I want, when I want it's the kinds of foods, I don't have to forage for things at the airport or at room service. Um, you know, or fast food, which I prefer not to eat because it gives me the shits. And so I've always got good food. And I tell you, when I was in college, I towed it around a backpack that didn't have any books in it. It had all food that I had taken from the, the cafeteria that morning and put into plastic Ziploc bags. And I would eat that out all day long because I was perpetually bulking all through college. You had your priorities straight. Um, yeah. Yeah. By the way, if you haven't tried Stan's meals, they're damn good. So um, I especially like your breakfast, and that's a good fourteen hundred calories and a pretty easy to eat breakfast. So that that works pretty damn yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. I like that you're focused on digestion too, Stan. Um, I've had some GI issues that I've shared on the channel before, and um, w would you mind running us through the things that you recommend against to avoid gastric distress? Yeah. You know, and I should have mentioned that I said I keep fibers lower because of digestion because it helps you, because they can fill you up and, and if you're trying to bulk. But I learned this on both ends of the spectrum. Remember, I competed in, as a professional bodybuilder. I dieted down to 5% body fat many, many, many times for a 30 year period and bulked up for 300 pounds. And I, I found that people in my industry, uh, bodybuilding, figure, physique, powerlifting, the vast majority of them tend to suffer from digestive distress, uh, gas, bloating, IBS, a host of other uh, potentially more serious Crohn's um, digestive problems. And so anytime you suffer from digestive distress and you go to a registered dietitian or a nutritionist, they'll implement what's called an elimination diet. That's very common, that's standard in the industry. Um, it's scientifically sound. The most successful, the most well-studied um, and uh, peer-reviewed published elimination diet is called the FODMAP, F-O-D-M-A-P, fermentable oligodye monosaccharides and polyols, at Monash University in Australia. And they just rate foods based on the likelihood that they can cause, uh, they can aggravate symptoms of IBS or cause 
a significant level of uncomfortable gas and bloating. It's not a good, bad food conversation. I'll be really cautious to say that. Some people can eat anything. They have garbage disposals for, for guts, and they don't need to digest or to avoid any foods. Just because somebody has a peanut allergy doesn't mean you recommend that nobody eats peanuts. And the same would be true of, of eggs, which can be allergic to some people. The same could be true of dairy um, uh, or even shellfish. Those are commonly foods that some people have either an allergy or an intolerance to, which is two completely different things, intolerance being dose dependent. Um, and and it may bode, it may serve you well to uh, limit food, uh, eliminate foods that you're allergic to and limit foods that you have um, an intolerance to. So this is kind of the FODMAP menu from Monash is a good guideline that I've found to be very effective. And the research shows as well that uh, people who implement that 60 to 80 percent uh, uh, realize a significant decrease in symptoms. And so uh, those foods tend to be uh, things like sugar alcohols, sorbitol, mannitol, xylitol. Uh, they're indigestible. They can cause diarrhea. And again, that could be dose dependent and individualistic. Um, things like cruciferous vegetables, too much broccoli, um, cauliflower, asparagus. It's again, how it's prepared also matters. If you cook it soft, it, has uh, less, it's less burdensome and less potential of causing gas than if you eat it raw. Again, not a good food, bad food conversation, just that if you have digestive distress, these are the types of foods that might uh, aggravate that problem. Uh, some grains, and th this isn't just for people with, with uh, celiac disease who have to avoid um, grains, but uh, in general, Consuming a lot of grains, a lot of bread, a lot of oatmeal can be difficult to digest. That's not that one cup could be fine, but three cups uh, can start to cause you problems. Lane's diet that was prescribed to him by a registered dietitian included like five cups of quinoa a day. Good luck digesting that if you're on a 7,000 calorie diet trying <laughs> to gain weight. And so I just try and point out the fact that some foods are easier to digest than others. That's why I prefer uh, uh, using white rice over... Uh, an alternative carbohydrate source that might cause, you know, lots and lots of bread or, or oats uh, or even pasta can, you know, you get done with a huge bowl of spaghetti and you lay there with a giant uh, bloated stomach for hours. Um, you might not have uh, the same response from eating white rice. Uh, now that means you could have some pasta, but I wouldn't drive that as my primary calorie uh, surplus because it could uh, prevent you from digesting that food as fast or make you uncomfortable in the process. So that's, that's kind of how I break down the FODMAP menu, which I, of course, include in, in my literature. Um, and that's not to say those foods are bad. Yep. Yep. I'm glad you make the distinction. Uh, first of all, I'm glad you're a supporter of milk because milk is mammal growing juice, as Rip likes to put it. And uh, it's crucial for what we do. And I also like the fact that you make the distinction about things being dose dependent. <laughs> So you, uh, you have a great point in your book where you talk about, you know, just because you have lactose issues doesn't mean you should totally cut out dairy. W would you mind expanding upon that? Yeah, and this isn't just my study. I I'm trying to remember if, uh, who the professor was up in, in Canada. Was it Stu Phillips' lab, potentially, uh, that um, when they tested, uh, when they blind tested, uh, their subjects on dairy consumption rather than, you know, because some people, they, if, they, if they think they're going to have a problem, they're going to have a problem. Uh, when they blind tested people who said they had a, a dairy intolerance, they could handle a, a pretty significant amount. Over 90 plus percent of them didn't have any issues when they weren't aware uh, that, it was, that it was dairy. Having said that, there are some people that have an al dairy allergy who should not consume dairy. And those who have an intolerance can co usually consume different amounts based on the lactose presence. Um, if you have a lactose intolerance, it's dose dependent. And uh, it could have to do with also the amount of lactose that's in the food. So milk would be the highest in lactose. Uh, a Greek yogurt would be much, much less. And it's very well tolerated because it also has the digestive enzymes in it. Uh, cheddar cheese, very, very little lactose almost non-existent. And then Fairlife, of course, has lactase enzyme in their products. And so uh, that's very well tolerated. Uh, and the reason it's important, like you said, it does, it does appear to help with IGF-1 stimulation and it's a good, good mass product, probably more so just because it's liquid calories and it does consume 
uh, you know, it's an animal source of proteins, fats, and carbs. Uh, that's probably the primary driver. But calcium is another huge component of performance. I don't think people appreciate that calcium isn't just for bones. It's for nerve signaling and it's for muscle contraction and relaxation. And those who are familiar with muscle physiology will know that the calcium that's stored in the endoplasmic reticulum, which is released, by the way, by uh, sufficient uh, glucose or glycogen storage in that same, I should say, sarcoplasmic reticulum inside the muscle cell. That calcium triggers, that was the tropomyo troponin, tropomyosin uh, uh, trigger for activating muscle contraction and relaxation. So sometimes people end up with heavy legs or some cramping. It could be a calcium deficiency of all things and not even uh, electrolytes such as uh, sodium and potassium, which are also important. But uh, I've just found that uh, that we get better performance when we pay attention to all of these micronutrients in sufficient quantities. About a thousand milligrams a day of uh, of calcium would be necessary. So, uh, also how much you drink at a given time. You might be able to handle four to eight ounces in one meal. Uh, so, twelve to sixteen would would aggravate you. So, drink less. Also, if you've abstained from any lactose-containing foods for a while the lactase enzyme in your system will downregulate. And so you might have to slowly titrate lactose back into your system, a couple ounces the first day, four ounces the second, blah, 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 and progress such that eventually your lactase enzyme upregulates and you can more sufficiently digest those foods. Yep, yep. And, and I think the one of the main points there is to not come to a conclusion and, and to not be black and white about it because there are many people out there that did go mad after reporting that drinking milk upsets their stomach. So it's a matter of titrating up just like Stan said. Um, the point you made about calcium is interesting. Can you educate us on vitamins and minerals? So what do you recommend? You know, what kind of blood work do you get to measure this stuff? Just anything you want to mention about uh, how to make sure we have the vitamins and minerals that we need for performance and health? You know, generally speaking, if you get a pretty diverse diet, you're going to get 99% of the necessary vitamins and minerals just from your diet. And when I say diverse, I'm really first and foremost talking about getting sufficient protein from a broad range of animal-based sources. They're the most nutrient-dense. They're the most highly bioavailable. Uh, Let me get, stop you right uh, there, Stan. I saw a documentary that said that a plant-based diet is the healthiest way to go. So uh, I think you might be wrong, bud. Yeah, we're, we're obviously going to have lots of disagreements on that from the vegan community, <laughs> uh, but uh, that gets batted back and forth a lot, <laughs> but particularly where it, where it pertains to protein, and as especially when you're talking about children or people as they age, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the higher protein quality from animal proteins, the leucine content that's available is important. And there's some research now that suggests we need about twice as much leucine as we get north of 50. And that's hard to get. You'd have to eat a ton of vegetables to do that. And the kinds of vegetables that you would eat might uh, drive your total calorie intake up. Sorry, my throat's bothering me here. And, and be really damn tough to digest. You know, just like the quinoa example that you gave. If you're pounding all these yeah. fibrous vegetables, trying to get your protein from these low bioavailable sources, um, you're probably not going to feel great. Yeah. And, you know, I have a, I have vegan clients and I have a chapter in my book on vegetarian vegan. And it's certainly a, a, a plausible, uh, I, I say there's many paths to the same destination. And, and if that's your choice, uh, then you could certainly, it's, you could certainly do it. But my, my big thing is compliance. Hard to comply with a diet like that for most people, certainly for kids. And so, uh, you generally have to supplement the protein, uh, like a soy protein or a, a, a pea protein has sufficient leucine for the supplement. So I don't, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to, to speak poorly of, of the diet, uh, of the, of the diet's capacity to provide the nutrients. Uh, it's just, it's hard to comply with just the application uh, particularly for kids, kids and elderly. Right. And so, uh, and then the bioavailability of those nutrients is important. Uh, you know, the, the type of vitamin A that you get, the type of vitamin D that you get, the type of omega-3s that you get uh, aren't very bioavailable and from uh, food sources. So I use a broad range of protein sources. I like to keep red meat in the diet because it's very high in iron, B12 and zinc, uh, three, six and nine times that of chicken. And it, uh, I like to keep and creatine and carnitine and all those things. 
certainly want to keep salmon in the diet for the omega-3s. Uh, they're available in salmon. Uh, whole eggs for the choline and the K2 and the biotin that's in the egg yolk, which is often eliminated in dieters' diets and shouldn't be. Uh, uh, so a variety of protein sources. We mentioned dairy, how important that is for calcium. And, uh, so we keep that in the diet, particularly the probiotics from yogurt, if you can incorporate that into the diet. And then anything else, I build the foundation of the remaining micronutrients from fruits and vegetables. And I, I kind of primarily lead with fruits because they're generally easier to digest. Um, uh, but also I put some vegetables in there and then I, I look for uh, first and foremost, the low FODMAP vegetables, as, as mentioned earlier, uh, to get you know, a broad range. Generally, it's fiber that we're chasing at that point, not micronutrients. There aren't too many micronutrients other than maybe vitamin C. Uh, that you wouldn't get from just the animal-based diet itself. So we're kind of just trying to get sufficient fiber in the diet, which can help with mitigating uh, uh, saturated fat clearance to get adequate soluble fiber because uh, we got to be cautious about our lipids, obviously, and saturated fats seems to be the primary driver of L LDL elevation, which isn't, the, you know, I hate to get too deep into this, but isn't the, the primary cause of atherosclerosis or even one of the most... Um, uh, one of the highest hazard ratios for uh, cardiovascular disease, insulin resistance is much higher, obesity is much higher, um, uh, smoking is much higher. So it is a risk, but it's, it's, uh, it's not as nearly as significant. So I don't want to overemphasize uh, uh, LDL's contribution to, to mortality, uh, but it is a risk factor. And so we can mitigate that just by decreasing some saturated fat in the diet, which you know, I prescribe about a 35% protein diet overall. And the proteins that I recommend, uh, even the red meats, the lean proteins from top sirloin are only about 30% saturated fat. So if you're, if you got 30% protein and only 30% of that saturated fat, you're 30 times, you know, 0.30 times 0.30 is, is 9%. And that's well within the American Heart Association's recommendation for uh, where you want to keep your saturated fats. Aside from that, uh, just avoiding butter and bacon can go a long way. Dairy products, dairy fat, uh, does not contribute. The saturated fats in dairy fat has not been shown to contribute to cardiovascular disease. That's cheese and milk and even full fat dairy. Uh, and the lower fat dairies, 2%, 1%, has been shown to be cardioprotective. So it's a different type of fat. Now, when you process that into butter and start to overconsume that, uh, then your saturated fats may reach a point at which you uh, can't clear them fast enough. And that's individualistic. That's about 30% of the population that might have uh, what we call hypercholesterolemia. So I don't know how far I'm driving off track, but to get no, back to great. the micronutrients. Keep going, man. Uh, thank you. I, I mentioned in the micronutrients that I just, I chase potassium primarily in my carbohydrates first. So you notice the, the food choices because that's a you know, next to sodium, potassium is one of the, the um, highest uh, quantity of electrolytes in your system. Great for so many things, for heart arrhythmias, for uh, joints, for uh, uh, balancing water balance in the body between sodium and potassium. Uh, uh, it's just fantastic for so many things. And so I lead with, uh, you know, potato because it's twice the potassium as a banana. I lead with uh, fruits because they're high in potassium. Uh, and then yogurt, of course, and then meat has 100 milligrams of potassium per every ounce. So the foundation of my diet is really about getting the rest of that 4,700 milligrams of potassium that you need daily. And that comes from primarily those foods that I mentioned and, uh, you know, some spinach, some peppers, uh, which are low gas, squash, uh, cucumber, again, low gas. And that's not to say you can't throw in a bowl of oatmeal or some broccoli. It's just that, that if you're having digestive distress, then you'd watch how much of those that you would consume. So the biggies are getting sufficient so sodium in the diet, particularly for athletes. I want to be really cautious to say that about 25% of the population is salt sensitive and they suffer from uh, uh, high blood pressure. And so you'd want to be cautious how much sodium they, they consume. The rest of the population, if they're active, probably doesn't need to worry about it. There's no indication that, that salt in the absence of elevated blood pressure can contribute to any health problems. Uh, and most of us who are trying to eat healthy generally are trying to avoid fast food and avoid packaged food, which is where the bulk of the sodium in the diet is. And so you kind of want to add some back in. And this isn't a more is better scenario. It's just having sufficient salt 
in your diet so that your performance, your stamina and endurance and energy in the gym is sufficient. Things like brain fog uh, and this, the balance between sodium and potassium. So you've got salt uh, or sodium in particular, but sodium is sodium chloride and hydrochloric acid that you digest food with is, is chloride. So that's important. Uh, potassium, I mentioned, uh, 4,700 milligrams a day from a potato and, um, uh, and yogurt and fruit. Um, then uh, calcium, 1,000 milligrams a day. We went over that in great detail. Magnesium, very hard to get from food. You can eat you know, nuts and almonds and stuff, but some of that's bound up by anti-nutrients. It doesn't seem to be sufficient to get you the 400 plus milligrams of magnesium a day. So we do recommend supplementing magnesium. That's one supplement that we kind of come out of the gate with, particularly for active individuals. The other one's vitamin D, uh, which is more of a marker than a maker of disease, uh, meaning that people who have disease tend to have lower vitamin D as a result of, of the disease state, not necessarily um, get a disease because of low vitamin D, if that makes sense. Um, and But we do want to supplement vitamin D if we're low, but also it'd be, it'd be uh, pretty smart to figure out uh, why. Do you have inflammation? Do you have you know some other metabolic uh, disease that's causing a low vitamin D? So we supplement that because it's hard to get from food. Uh, and those are the two that we supplement. Beyond that, just about everything's covered with the diet itself. And, uh, and we don't recommend a lot of supplementation except for in specific circumstances. The cholesterol point you made and it's linked to atherosclerosis is an interesting one. And for those of you that want to learn more about this, there's a great book that Rip and Steph recommended to me called uh, Doctoring Data. So check that out if you want the full lowdown on how that whole uh, bout of misinformation, let's call it, uh, made its way into the into the public sphere. Um, and then Stan, do you do you measure this stuff? So I know you're big on blood work. Do you uh, take measurements to make sure your your uh, vitamins and minerals are where they need to be? I wish I I wish I could. And unfortunately, the blood work only shows us what's in the blood, and uh, it does not show us what's in. Uh, the rest of the body in the cells or in the bones or uh, uh, in the muscles. And so it's, it's not easy to determine those things. And uh, probably the best things you could do is get one of those, uh, access one of the chronometer, uh, put all your food into a chronometer. It's, a, it's a, like an app uh, or a, a log system that allows you to just enter all your food in there and will show you about how much of your nutrients that you're getting each of these these nutrients um you can test vitamin d with vitamin d25 hydroxy in the blood test you can text things like b vitamins or magnesium uh also rbc you know, in the blood uh, but it wouldn't show you what was in storage you can test iron uh i didn't specifically mention iron because if we're consuming meat generally speaking we're fine in terms of iron and some people may even go out overload which i address also in the book in terms of testing and mitigation but uh, uh, you can test all those things iron storage ferritin um, so all those things are available but uh, and i do recommend a, a pretty comprehensive blood test which more recently i started working with a company called merrick health m-a-r-e-k health.com and they have some of the most affordable blood testing that's probably half the price of what I've ever used to pay through my other providers. And so I can get a very complete panel for about hundred dollars a month uh, from them. It's uh, you just pick your own panel. They have some, some panels in the, on their website that, uh, that are prefab that you can select from as well, or more comprehensive and a little more expensive, but it, if a barrier to entry to getting a blood test is the expense, uh, then, then just, DM me, I'll send you a copy of my budget blood test. It's $100. There's no excuse for not getting that. And the reason I'm so adamant about it is because we have had some large athletes over the years that didn't pay attention to their blood pressure, didn't pay attention to their blood thickness, RBC, hemoglobin, hematocrit. And uh, unfortunately, they ended up passing away. And uh, I think it's uh, largely preventable. A lot of what I do now, a lot of recommendations I make for the athletes I work with uh, are to mitigate damage, are to make them... Uh, able to compete, uh, I want to say as healthy as possible. And those who have watched my YouTube rant that said, if you want to be healthy, you don't compete. I'm, I'm quick to decipher between health and fitness. And they're not the same thing. You know, yeah. fitness being the ability to perform a particular duty or task. And that's not always healthy. 
the fitness level required to be a world's strongest man is not healthy. Yep. Uh, so you need to do a lot of things behind the scenes to try and mitigate some of the damage that you're doing to your body. And it's not just world's strongest men. This is 14 year old gymnasts in the Olympics suffer from significant injuries. This is uh, runners, any competitive uh, female distance runner. Uh, we've seen, in, uh, you know, quite popularly in the media about uh, um, the Nike sponsored runners up there who were getting shin splints and suffering from the female triad with uh, you know, chronic calorie restriction and anemia uh, and uh, amenorrhea, cessation of menstrual period. Uh, those are, you know, those are tragic. Uh, uh, bone loss, osteopenia, uh, very common. So uh, all of this stuff needs to be addressed. I talk about it all in the book, but it, it, it kind of starts with a blood test, as you mentioned, and then a, a sufficient diet plan so that you're not suffering from all of these problems on both ends of the spectrum, over dieting and over consuming. So other than keeping an eye on H&H &H and blood pressure, are there any other markers in a blood test that you're looking for that are good indicators from your point of view of overall health? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of them in there. Obviously, inflammation, C-reactive protein, and homocysteine uh, uh, are, are good to look at in terms of inflammation. Um, we talked what about, about ferritin iron? and iron. About blood I'm yes, I'm uh, I'm not I'm not educated on this, but I'm I'm hearing grumblings about um, if those are out of whack, you can uh, deposit. Um, uh, I'm not probably going to butcher this, but but uh, you can deposit iron along your arterial walls, which which um, speeds up the onset of atherosclerosis. Is there any truth to that from the yeah. research you've done? Absolutely, that kind of takes us back to that conversation about cardiovascular disease risk, and is LDL you know a huge driver of that? Uh, it, it, it is a marker, it, it, it is causal, but to what degree in the absence of endothelial damage, and as you said, depositing iron in, in the arteries, the endothelial lining of the blood vessels is what's damaged by things like high blood sugar, high iron, high blood pressure. If you can keep those things normal, then the likelihood you're gonna deposit LDL into those uh, into your endothelial lining is uh, is uh, much much smaller. So I think myopically focusing on LDL and not paying attention to the the, the much higher risk factors, blood sugars, iron levels, blood pressure, uh, is is backwards the way to go. So we do test for blood sugars. We test for iron uh, and uh, ferritin, uh, stored iron, and we you know the way to a couple ways to mitigate that. You can donate blood, but you got to be careful if you're donating too much blood, then you might start getting uh, low ferritin and low platelets, and then your performance suffers. You, you start not having the oxygen necessary um, to, to perform, and you find that you gas out real quick. There's other ways to mitigate iron consumption. You can decrease the iron that you consume, but um, uh, Dr. Chris Masterjohn talks about this. He's got uh, familial hemochromatosis, so he, he has elevated iron uh, just genetically. And he still eats red meat he, and donates periodically because he doesn't want to miss out on all the other nutrients. If he can get rid of the iron with donating and still get all of the other nutrients in red meat, the B12 and the, the zinc and, and the carnitine and carnosine and all the other things that are great about it, then he seems it's just as easy to do it that way uh, rather than, than come up deficient in those other nutrients. Also consuming calcium, uh, dairy with your iron sources, uh, helps to decrease the, the absorption of iron. On the opposite end of the spectrum, you get a lot of women that are low iron because they have the, the monthly menstrual period and they'll end up with anemia quite often. And we have some strategies for that. Obviously, you can increase your, your heme iron intake from red meat, but also your non-heme iron uh, when consumed together uh, increases the total absorption. And vitamin C, you consume those three together and avoid dairy in that given meal you'll have an increase in iron absorption for women who are generally low in iron. So we use those strategies as well. Other blood tests, uh, obviously blood sugars are huge. There's lagging indicators for high blood sugars for insulin resistance, and that's your fasted glucose and your HA1C. Those things can actually stay in the normal range for many years, if not a decade or more, while you have signs of insulin resistance that aren't detected by those two tests. And those signs would be elevated triglycerides, and elevated fasted insulin. Those are what we call leading indicators. When you see those things starting to elevate, you know that your body is starting to resist or has some insulin resistance. Uh, the insulin is generally not tested and the triglycerides are generally confused with lipids uh, when in fact it's really uh, 
your body's converting the fats, uh, the sugars into triglycerides. And so uh, we, we use those markers to tell us, hey, this person's got blood sugar problems. Obviously, weight loss is one of the, the biggest drivers of, of, uh, of improving blood sugars. Uh, better sleep improves blood sugars as, blood as well as blood pressure. Things like a CPAP for uh, heavy athletes can have a significant impact on blood pressure and blood sugars. Um, but also smaller things that people can do to improve blood sugars. Uh, the 10 minute walks you've mentioned are twice as effective as metformin, the number one prescribed di type two diabetes medication in the world. A 10 minute walk after meals is twice as effective at preventing or reversing type two diabetes. So what it does is it helps what we call postprandial glycemia, the amount of uh, blood sugar elevation that occurs after a meal. Uh, the 10 minute walk stimulates the muscles. The muscles absorb glucose from the bloodstream without the need of insulin. So it, it decreases what we call that the area under the curve for insulin elevation. And so they're very effective, not just for digestion and, and recovery. And as you say, for just family time and, and just cleaning the brain out and recharging your battery, but they mitigate blood sugar elevations, decreasing carbohydrates obviously can have some benefit. Uh, timing them around workouts is how I prefer to do that. Uh, so we can still have, get the performance and benefit from them because uh, it's not always just weight loss. So there's a host of different things that you can do uh, to, to improve these blood markers uh, that are, you know, some of which are independent of weight loss because I can't always have, uh, like when I was working, uh, you know, when I'm working with strong men and the like, they, don't, they, they can't drop weight the last 60 days before a, a competition. You know, mass moves mass. That's a bad idea. And a guy like Lane Johnson, you know, he needs to be 330 on the field and he has a hard time maintaining that weight. And so I can't have him lose weight. I've got to intervene for some of his potential, uh, you know, mitigate some of his potential health uh, issues that might come from being that heavy by utilizing all these other methods, using a CPAP, taking 10 minute walks after meals, increasing potassium and calcium and magnesium consumption to improve uh, blood pressure. Uh, those kinds of things uh, have made him and many others that, that hold on to weight improve their health, mark health markers independent of weight loss. Carrying muscle mass helps with glucose regulation too, doesn't it? Because muscles are uh, big sponges for sugar in the bloodstream, aren't they? 100%. And moving that muscle is, is important as well. Just having it sedentary doesn't seem to do much. But uh, it, it does store glycogen, but it also stores it at a much greater rate when you move. But that's why the 10 minute walks are so effective, particularly after each meal. Three 10 minute walks a day after meals, much better than one 30 or 40 minute bout of exercise at the end of the day for managing glucose. Yep. Yeah. And, um, you know, type two diabetes is a, it's a lifestyle disease. So if you're, if you're lifting weights, if you're trying to clean up your diet using Stan's methods, um, if you're avoiding giant sugar binges. If you're taking those walks, it's something you can certainly manage. Um, yeah, I put a high blood sugar and a high blood pressure quick fix kit in, in the book and in my vertical diet 3.0 ebook, which is a little more comprehensive and has some more specific information for athletes. Um, and you know, a couple of the things on that list, I'm, I'm flicking through the book here now as, as we're talking, so my brain's in so, so many places right now, but, uh, I'm, just I just flicked past GERD, you know, acid reflux, which is something we also address and have a quick fix kit for. Um, a couple of the things on that blood sugar thing is to increase protein intake. They just recently published a study that showed that uh, increasing your protein intake to 30% of total calories was better for, for blood sugar management than, say, the Mediterranean diet, which is about an 18% total protein intake. So protein by itself, protein consumption in a meal, uh, tends to help with blood sugars. And then eating the protein first uh, in the meal also helps with mitigation of blood sugars. And having a larger meal earlier in the day uh, helps mitigate blood sugars in subsequent meals of all things. Having a higher protein, larger meal for breakfast helps decrease postprandial glycemia in the subsequent meals throughout the day. So just a, a little list of stuff like that. Uh, that you can implement to help with your blood sugars. I wonder if the protein effect is because it's more metabolically inefficient to digest and so that your, your body's actually doing work to, uh, to process the protein versus 
what it would do with a with carb or, or with a, with a fat is any idea what the cause is there yeah i'm not certain what the mechanism of action is these are outcome studies uh and they may have have posited what that was and i, I didn't uh, I, I tend to focus a lot on outcomes and when i see a study i'm like okay <laughs> everybody likes to talk about potential mechanisms of action uh but when you get you know human trials and you don't see a result uh those you know you quickly want to start disregarding what what could possibly be the explanation if, if that's just kind of a broad brush on that kind of thing but i do think it has something to do with the heat the temperature your body temperature increases the uh the thermic effect of food uh and you you burn significantly more calories digesting it so uh, i'm not certain if it if it influences the number of carbs you eat in subsequent meals just because you're eating more protein mm. in a given meal you're obviously eating less of something else going to a 30% protein diet as opposed to a 15% protein diet, you have to eat less of something else. Um, and again, limiting carbohydrates could certainly be uh, uh, an effective uh, intervention, at least an initial intervention for somebody who has type two diabetes and is obese and uh, is not terribly active. But they've done studies showing uh, high carb and low carb diets and they have equivalent outcomes for weight loss and glycemic control. And so it's it, the weight loss itself, I've said this many times, 95% of health benefits are realized simply from the weight loss itself, irrespective of diet. And I hate to say that as a guy who's pretty picky about what he eats, but the McDonald's diet, the 7-Eleven diet, the Twinkies diet, all showed improvements in blood pressure, blood sugar, and uh, uh, lipids simply from the weight loss itself. And it's not to say those things are sustainable or, or even healthy in terms of micronutrient, potential micronutrient deficiencies long-term or you know, appetite, satiety, uh, and compliance long-term, but uh, the weight loss is the primary intervention that you're concerned with. And uh, another study came out recently showing that uh, if you're looking just at blood sugars as, a, as the as the, you know, this is triage. You got a guy in your office that's got type two diabetes and he's, you know, 50 pounds overweight or obese. Uh, the, a, a liquid diet was the most effective intervention. You know, that shake in the morning, shake for lunch, sensible dinner thing. It actually worked mm -hmm. better than uh, other interventions. Uh, it caused more weight loss faster uh, than other interventions, which had a bigger impact because of the weight loss yep. on uh, measures of, of uh, insulin resistance. And so, you know, I'm, I try not to be, I try not to be too dogmatic about, you know, the vertical diet or any other diet in that regard. Uh, I'm outcome oriented, but I'm also long-term oriented in a, 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 you know, a liquid diet or McDonald's diet. It's not something that, uh, that somebody could or should maintain long-term uh, because most people, you know, 95% of people gain back almost all of their weight within three years. Yeah, and that's the nice thing about what you've set up here is you've outlined a way that you can eat sustainably. This is something you can do. And and in fact, we interviewed one of the trainees from, from the Denver gym a couple of weeks back, and he was the first guy to pull a 600-pound deadlift, just a normal guy pulling a 600-pound deadlift in one of our gyms. And uh, one of the reasons why he's been successful is your your tagline, compliance is the science, not just with the training program, but with eating vertical meals constantly, like he, he completely adhered to your, to your diet and sleeping, sleeping is crucial. Um, yeah. And I love the fact that you are outcome oriented because as we find the theory does not always match what we find, what we look at in practice, what actually occurs in the real world. Uh, so that's a critical point to make. Um, let's talk about the CPAP for a minute. So that's something that, uh, I'm really glad that you're promoting, you know, I don't, I don't think it's promoted enough. And in fact, um, the gal that, that helps me locally here with my, you know, I've got to go through insurance to get a good deal and to get sleep studies and all this stuff. The gal that I work with is very educated on this and I'm going to do a podcast episode just talking about sleep and how you can improve your sleep situation. Um, but Stan, talk to us about sleeping issues, especially with big guys and uh, how the CPAP, because for me, based on your recommendation, Nick Delgadillo got into it, he recommended it to me. And um, it's an absolute life changer. Like my eyes would not be this clear with bags this small had I not slept with my CPAP last night, um, no matter what else I try, right? So I'd, I'd love to hear your input on um, why you think that's so important and how it works. Yeah, I hear you, brother. I lived through it. And ever since my body weight got north of, say, 230 plus, 
my sleep started to get worse and worse and worse. And as I told you, I've been over 300 pounds a few times over the years. Uh, once you start snoring and waking up tired, start holding your breath at night during sleep, those are probably the two of the, the, the easiest indicators, snoring and waking up tired. It's actually part of the stop bang questionnaire, which is what uh, practitioners use to diagnose, uh, at least initially, to diagnose sleep apnea. Um, once you start snoring and waking up tired, uh, you, you're probably holding your breath at night and have some degree of sleep apneas. There's different degrees. It's on a continuum. Now, certain things start to happen. Uh, you don't recover as fast from workouts. Your blood pressure elevates. Your blood sugars elevate. Uh, things like erectile dysfunction, uh, brain fog. Like you said, your eyes just, uh, just not being awake. You start to get episodes of you know, sleeping during the day, et cetera. It's just very, very, very uncomfortable. So I recommend that folks that have that problem and aren't able to fix it with weight loss, and, and it's not always fixable with weight loss, it does have to do with neck girth. Uh, you know, uh, there's plenty of 198 pound power lifters that are relatively lean that because they squat a lot and have a thick neck, they have sleep apnea and they need to, to use a CPAP in order to, to resolve that problem. The, the CPAP can be difficult and expensive and time consuming for some people, particularly internationally. I find this with my clients in Canada and Europe and Australia. With socialized medicine, it can take them a long time to get an appointment. And then if it's not severe apnea, they're often just recommended to lose weight. Uh, none of my, you know, big athletes want to lose weight. They want to they want to try and improve their blood pressures and blood sugars and energy levels and recovery uh, with another remedy. And that's going to be the CPAP. Uh, so I have been recommending, much to the chagrin of the medical community, although I don't think there's very uh, a significant uh, downside to it in terms of contraindications or health issues that people get a CPAP off of Craigslist or try and find one of the internet companies that sell them without a prescription. Uh, they're self monitoring. Now the auto CPAPs interpret your breathing and give you the, uh, the amount of uh, air pressure that you need uh, and will tell you what that pressure was. It, it, it measures it throughout the night. When I was at my last um, sleep study, the doctor used the pressure number off of the machine uh, to determine where to set my CPAP. And uh, so these machines are pretty smart now. They'll breathe for you. Plus, when I used to, I've been using one since the early 90s when my weight got, got up. Uh, they used to be CPAPs, continuous positive air pressure or whatever it's called. And so it was like driving down the freeway with no windshield on. It was just psh, your face <laughs> the whole night. Yeah. Really uncomfortable. Now they're actually called BiPAPs. When you exhale, the machine interprets that and stops pushing air in. And there's different levels that you can set that at. We call it expiratory pressure relief and so that they're more comfortable. I, I nap with them. I travel with mine. I never sleep without it. The quality of my sleep is, uh, is fantastic as a result of using that. And like you said, and I hate using this term because I've been around this business a long time. It's life-changing. I say that about my thermos and having my meals life-changing. I don't make any money saying that. I don't make any money telling people to buy CPAPs. It's just that it's, it's probably the biggest uh, thing that you could do in an individual's program that would provide them with so many benefits. Hoffler was not wearing a CPAP. Brian Shaw was not wearing a CPAP. Dan Green was not wearing a CPAP. Uh, Lane Johnson was not wearing a CPAP. It was the first, I mean, that's low-hanging fruit. As a trainer, you know, I'm thinking to myself, when, when one of these guys reaches out to me, I'm like, how can I help these guys? They're the best athletes in the world. And uh, that's low-hanging fruit. I, I just swept on in there and made sure they had a CPAP. And the next day, they were like, wow, you know, I, I feel so much better, like you said. Uh, just within a day or three, that, that, that's life-changing. and just makes things easier on them, lowers their blood pressure. Lane Johnson's blood pressure, I think, was uh, his systolic pressure. And I I think it was in the low 150s. Uh, he wasn't wearing a CPAP. It, it, we put 20 pounds on him. He went from 313 pounds to 330, low 330s. We put 20 pounds on him uh, in the off season before this last year. Uh, and he, uh, his blood pressure went down 20 points to 132, I think it was, which for a 330 pound lineman, I don't, I don't expect to get much lower than 132. We implement some of the things in the CPAP, the 10-minute walks, the vitamin D, the increased potassium and calcium intake. 
But aside from that, we put on 20 pounds and he lost 20 points on his systolic blood pressure. So that's the kind of intervention that would have that big of an impact for most people who had apnea. How is a guy's blood sugar that's that big? Is he, uh, is his blood sugar in check? Yes. Yeah. And now initially, uh, you know, with the, with the, uh, the, uh, bulking diet, the, uh, go mad diet, and, uh, uh, what did I call it? The, uh, uh, my brain's escaping me. We do see elevated blood sugars. Uh, when I started working with Hofthor, he was 440 pounds. I actually brought him down to the high three nineties. We took about 7%. He was 440, 430 <laughs> something when I first started working with him, but he, he had a significant amount of body fat on him. He was eating, uh, you know, he was in a, in a dirty bulk, I guess is what mm -hmm. the word I was looking for. Um, and we ran his blood tests and he did have, uh, the metabolic syndrome issues. The ones I had experienced myself through, many times throughout my career when I got over 300 pounds. Uh, and so we dieted him down. We took off about 7% of his body weight. That's kind of a standard that I utilize if somebody's got fatty liver because you can resolve about 90% of fatty liver with about a 7% weight loss. You can restore beta cell function with about 15% weight loss for people who are, who are type 2 diabetic insulin dependent. If you can get their beta cell function to restore, uh, then they can get off of insulin. And that can occur uh, for most. There are some that can't uh, with about a 15% weight loss. So we took 7% off, and that's always hard to talk to people about. It's kind of how we launched this whole conversation today in terms of recommending what people do. Um, I have them periodize their weight. I have them go through bulking and, and, and weight loss, you know, fat loss, muscle gain and fat loss cycles, I guess I should call it, rather than bulking and losing. Because I, I want to I gain muscle and I want to lose fat. And so I have them periodize their body weight, which has not been – uh, historically very common with power lifters and strongmen. Uh, they would just stay heavy all year round. And even when they learned not to lift heavy all year round, they would still stay heavy all year round. That didn't make sense to me. Uh, great Olympic athletes like uh, Klokov, uh, the Olympic uh, uh, lifter, he would do a lot of cardio in the off season, and which would really help him with his cardiovascular fitness. So when he transitioned into lifting heavier weights, he had a bigger GPP, a general physical preparedness, had a bigger cardiovascular base, so he could train more often and heavier and recover from the fatigue faster and ramp up into competition much quicker. Uh, so I, I kind of utilize that same strategy uh, with these heavier athletes. I get them to lose about 7% of their body weight. And then when I put it back on, I do it with all of those interventions, paying attention to blood pressure, blood sugar, and the CPAP, the 10-minute walks. So now we're gaining muscle back preferentially to fat. And we see it mitigates uh, the, the uh, recurrence of fatty liver to the degree that it had been previously. And I can generally see that with blood sugar, fasted insulin, triglycerides, uh, also things like AST, ALT enzymes, the liver enzymes. Uh, we see that those don't go back up as high as they were when originally started the athletes. So there's, uh, there's certainly healthier ways to gain weight. And those are, those are all the strategies I use and the way I monitor them. Yeah, I'm glad you made the distinction between uh, weight loss versus fat loss because I think that's a, a misnomer and that's not um, that distinction isn't made enough. So in that study you referenced, for example, where uh, fat loss or, or rather weight loss improved all these health outcomes, um, it's it's probably the fat loss, not the weight loss, that did that, right? Because we want to retain our muscle. And one of the things uh, we combat all the time in the gyms are people's misconceptions of body composition. So it's it's possible to gain weight and have your body fat percentage go down, right? Um, yeah. And it's just all about biasing muscle gain versus biasing fat loss or whatever your goals happen to be. Uh, but these these are distinctions that, that trip people up, and I think it's worth mentioning that. And that's why we don't just use the scale. We get a waist measurement, and we take progress pictures because we want to see uh, – that they're holding muscle and losing fat. Obviously, uh, I don't know how you, you describe the comparison, but fat's smaller than muscle, an equivalent measurement. And so you could stay the same scale weight, but lose four inches off your waist yep. because you were gaining muscle and losing fat at the same time, which it can be done. Beginners and significantly overweight individuals can do that relatively easily all the time. More experienced lifters that are closer to a, a healthy body weight will have a little harder time 
uh, gaining muscle and losing fat at the same time, which is why as we started this conversation, we talked about uh, setting yourself up for optimal uh, strength and muscle by being in a slight plus, and then just trying to hold on to that uh, as, as much as possible with uh, a modest deficit during periods of weight loss. Yeah, the shrinking waist deal as you're getting stronger is something we see every single day in our gyms. And in yeah. fact, I was just talking to a gal at the Boise gym, and she was telling me that uh, she was thinking about focusing on weight loss now because she's gained a couple of pounds. Um, and I said, well, what's happened to your waist? She goes, well, I'm down two notches on my belt. I was like, well, sounds to me like you're gaining muscle and losing fat, which is kind of the holy grail. Um, so maybe be, be happy with the fact that you're doing the best possible thing that you could be doing. And then I did the math for her. Like, even if you're, so if you gain five pounds of muscle and lost three pounds of fat, you're still up two pounds, right? So you've gained weight, but weight is not the relevant metric. You're getting stronger. And in your fifties as a woman, that's the most important thing you could possibly be doing. And by the way, on day one, you were squatting a broomstick and here we are a few weeks later, you're squatting a hundred pounds, right? So uh, keep doing that's what you're doing. That's fantastic. Yeah. And you know that's that's absolutely correct uh sometimes you'll hear women talk about i don't want to lift weights i'll get bulky 99 percent of the time somebody gets bulky from lifting weights they're overeating i'm yep. sorry <laughs> but that's a fact yep. and and there's a reason for that it's called compensation people oftentimes when they start a workout program they go you know they they go balls to the wall they, they go in hard and then what happens is, is you compensate, you sit more and you eat more as a result of being tired. And the combination of those two things, the, the loss of non-exercise activity, thermogenesis from sitting more, uh, and of course the eating more, uh, they, they, they gain fat. As, and that's exactly what happens in, in 99% of the cases. Uh, I would love to be, you know, getting too bulky from lifting. I mean, I've tried my whole life to get too bulky from lifting. It doesn't happen. It's fact. Luckily, the culture is changing. Luckily, this thing's becoming more popular with women. And my wife is very grateful to you, by the way, and she's grateful to Rip because she follows Rip's programming and she follows your nutrition advice roughly. And, um, you know, she's still in her early 30s, so aesthetics are very important to her, which I'm happy about. And she's got a, you know, ridiculous like 26-inch waist and a and 42-inch around the hips. And she's, you know, squatting and deadlifting over 200 and uh, – and being healthy and looks great. And um, th this is this is the solution. I mean, I think if you can figure out a way to optimize your recovery with your recommendation stand and then lift it in a, an intelligent way, the way re we recommend um, the benefits to your day-to-day -day life and your overall health are profound. I agree. And you know, some of it is pretty easy. And I, you know, I'm going to say it's simple, not easy. Uh, the, the the general protocol that you follow is really simple. Uh, of course, adherence is always the challenge. But like you said, especially for women, just increasing their protein intake and lifting heavy weights. I, I mean, I could stop there. And and you, we would get 90% of or more of, of all the benefits that you're that you're searching for. I, I thought a lot about this kind of the vertical diet. Uh, the foundation of it is is the fact that it's kind of the anti-diet, the anti-guru diet that I grew up with in the late 80s, and early 90s, when I was training a lot of women for competition. They would, uh, and as myself as well, and a lot of bodybuilders, they would uh, over-restrict, uh, you know, under-eating, uh, and of course, decreasing the, eliminating a lot of foods. What's the first thing a guru dieter guy tells you, you or a nutritionist might tell, especially women when they come in and want to get on a diet? Well, you got to eliminate red meat, you got to eliminate dairy, you got to eliminate fruit, you got to get rid of the egg yolk, uh, eliminate salt, and none of that could be further from the truth. Mm -hmm. Those are the first food. That's everything I lead with. That's where all your micronutrients and protein and iron and zinc and biotin and, and everything that we've just discussed is, is in those foods. Then they tell them, okay, here's your egg whites which, by the way, bind to biotin and raw biotin from the body, which is for your skin, hair, and nails. And so as you diet, now you start to get dry skin and dry hair. It looks terrible. Uh, here's your tilapia. Well, now you're going to get iron deficiency, anemia, especially for women on, on hypochloric diets. Avoid dairy. Oh, great. Well, there's, you know, there's your, your calcium. Um, all those different things. And then load up on 10 pounds of broccoli a day to keep you full. Uh, well, that's got to feel great, you know, for your digestion. So 
all of these things, plus, you know, it can bind to iodine and, and now you've got iodine deficiency, which a whole host of other problems and energy and thyroid function. Now your hair starts falling out. These guru diets that, that they were putting on women in the, in the late 80s, and early 90s were confined to the fitness industry, the bodybuilding mm -hmm. figure, physique, bikini. And so it was kind of a small thing. You know, it was a niche deal. Well, in the last seven plus years, that industry has exploded. And now you've got soccer moms seeing these women, these competitive women on Instagram and everywhere else in the best shape of their life who have no idea everything they're suffering from behind the scenes, the female triad and the hair loss and the edema and the, the, the post competition weight regain and the depression and the going to the doctor for, for protocols for, uh, you know, vitamin D and glutathione and iron uh, because they've, you know, completely wrecked their bodies. And so that's when I started to get more and more outspoken about it in the vertical diet and started talking about the importance of eating a larger variety of, of foods and not demonizing the most important ones that we've been discussing here today. You are doing very important work, man. Uh, the message to women is starving yourself is not the answer. And this weight loss program may be pretty unhealthy. And um, lifting weights is really, really good for you, whether you're a guy or a gal. So it's a, it's a crucially important message, Stan. Thank you for, for propping that up. Yeah, thanks. And, you know, for trainers, it's fantastic. It's fantastic for what you guys are doing. And I think part of the reason you're expanding at such a great rate and helping so many people, anytime you focus on strength, that's an incredibly – remember I mentioned that, that certain diets give you a quicker result. And so, and even like the keto diet, you know, five, seven days later, you lost five pounds. Well, it's water, it's all water but yeah. at least you feel as though you're making progress. And I'm not a big fan of the keto diet, but uh, there's, you know, sometimes people want to see results, which is what's great about lifting for strength in particular. You get some, like you said, you go from a broomstick to a hundred pounds. That, that might happen in, in 60 days or less, yep. but every single workout you're getting stronger. And that's what hooks you. That's why all these CrossFit women, and God bless them, they created the, uh, I, I think, a, a more desirable and achievable uh, and healthier uh, model for what a women's physique should look like, as opposed to the Victoria's Secret uh, anorexic uh, uh, look. Um, they love powerlifting because once they start touching heavy weights, just like us, a deadlift or a squat, uh, then they want to go compete in powerlifting meets. And now on the two day meets, the women's uh, day is completely packed. It's full. And it's, it's generally, it's been a lot of CrossFit women who loved lifting weights and probably didn't like as much all the endurance stuff while running around uh, for 40 minutes doing something. When I get a client that I want to encourage to continue to lift, that's what I do. I have them pretty much, you know, do fives or even work up to a, a heavy single, the amount to be maxed. Because I know that three days later, they're going to come in and do one more rep or five more pounds of the same weight. And, and I can show that to them as progress. Uh, so we understand in the industry, a lot of that's neural adaptation, that, that they're just getting better and more practiced and coordinated and, and their body's learning to recruit the muscles necessary to do the work. Uh, but either way, it's, it, it's hugely beneficial for them to continue with it in, in, in a progressive nature that builds their uh, their muscle tissue long term, which is the key indicator of longevity. And I know that that VO2 max is, uh, I think, in the research shows to be the uh, the, the primary measurement of longevity, of mm -hmm. health span and lifespan. VO2 max is dependent upon lean body mass because mm -hmm. that's the the muscle is what uses the oxygen. Get somebody that has is suffering from a, you know, a significant degree of sarcopenia, they cannot get their heart rate up very high because they have no muscle to, to create that demand on the body. So they go hand in hand. You, you can't have one without the other. Uh, and so that's, and, and weightlifting increases VO2 max. Uh, anytime you put a heavy load on and lift it to within a rep or three of failure, your heart rate's going up. You're breathing a lot. Add some 10 minute walks to that, and you're pretty much done unless there's something else you'd like to do for your own personal enjoyment. Oh, yeah. And if you have sarcopenia, you almost certainly have osteopenia. And this is why yeah. what you're talking about here and lifting heavy weights for women is especially important for postmenopausal women because this is the, the antidote to frailty. And frailty can yeah. kill you. 
You know, you, you lose your balance because you're weak, you fall down, your bones can't handle the fall because you're frail, you break a hip, that could be game over. Um, so one of the, the, the demographics that we enjoy working with the most are postmenopausal women, because it's great to make a middle-aged accountant stronger than he was in college and put on a bunch of muscle mass and he's happy and having a great time. But to change an older gal's quality of life in that way is, is really satisfying for us. Probably the number one inter intervention for, uh, for postmenopausal and for things like PCOS. It's fantastic for lowering blood sugars, just to have more muscle and to use it more often. Yep. So Stan, you mentioned, uh, your coaching. I would like to hear if you're, if you have availability for people to hire you in general. And I'm also curious to know how things have changed since you went to the seminar, because I saw a pretty cool video of you and Juji Mufu and you were teaching him how to squat with his hips. And then John and I, Juji, uh, exchanged emails and he told me he had like 150 pounds to his squat, um, using, using his hips. So I'd love to hear any, any comments you have on that. Yeah, I, I kept trying after I quote unquote retired from powerlifting to lift heavy in the using the form that I traditionally had used uh, too much joint pain uh, on my uh, on my knees in particular. And when I saw Juji lead with a knee break on a heavy squat with knee wraps, uh, it was just, you know, simply a recommendation that I made to help him, uh, you know, change where the load was onto a larger muscle group that would uh, probably decrease his knee pain. Uh, and that was straight from Ripito seminars. Like you said, I'm always learning. I've been to a lot of seminars in the last few years. And I even got my CSCS just a couple of years ago. I, I studied exercise science at the University of Oregon back in the late 80s. Uh, and I have not given up on trying to learn more. And I, I follow some of the, the best names in the industry, uh, you know, Brad Schoenfeld and Brett Contreras and uh, Dr. Lenny Norton and of course uh, you know, Greg Knuckles and I mean the list goes on and on and on of the people that I follow I read all their stuff I buy their books I attend their seminars uh, I'm not too arrogant to think that you know that uh, that I can't still learn from folks and uh, you know it's it's been great passing along and I always definitely uh, you know give Rip and you guys at Starting Strength credit I mean, I don't think I could pass a starting strength coaching. You guys, your your knowledge of of, uh, of anatomy and, and uh, physiology is is extraordinary. The demand, the requirement for you to accomplish that, I think it's it's fantastic. And so, uh, you know, anytime that I come across someone that wants to to be you know coached on any of those lifts, I, if there's a starting strength group in their neighborhood, then I'll I'll refer them to that. What changed for me is that is that less pain. I started moving more in ways that didn't cause the acute stress to my joints. Uh, I took better care of my joints with the 10 minute walks and the, uh, you know, the, the recumbent bikes. And I just spent more time out of the gym, moving more like I did when I was actually competing, pulling sleds, things like that. And I'm pain free. I'm 54. I can still squat 600 for reps with no knee wraps or sleeves, walked out, buried, uh, my idea buried, but whatever. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't have any pain. Uh, I, don't, I don't have any back pain. I don't have any hip pain. I don't have any knee pain. Uh, and I believe, and I think this, the, the research supports this, that, uh, you know, in the absence of bloating, you're going to get atrophy of joints uh, long term. I think it's the number one thing you can do is responsibly manage and progress load over time. And I always get people when i put up a big lift, like, oh, Stan, you're going to break your back or your, you know, your knees are going to go out. The body is regenerative, not degenerative. And you have to provide it an adequate stimulus in order for it to continue to, like we talked about in terms of bone loading for osteoporosis and the requirement how muscle has to stress the bone or the axial loading has to be applied in order for the bone to have the right stimulus. So it doesn't start to atrophy. Um, we see this with uh, astronauts to, go to the moon under, uh, you know, decreased uh, uh, gravity that they have to send them up there with some sort of loading mechanisms, bands or whatever. And they still lose a significant amount of lean body mass uh, and uh, uh, bone mineral density because they don't adequately load. And so, uh, you know, I just, I'll, I'll argue just the opposite, that you should continue to, to fight uh, against uh, – uh, what do we say? The dimming of the light. <laughs> How's the poem go? <laughs> yep. Do not go gracefully into the, into the dark. <laughs> yeah. Yep. 
<laughs> very well said. Very well said. Um, that's a very powerful message. It's all about the stress recovery adaptation cycle. So if you fail to stress your body yes. adequately, it will diminish over time. And ultimately, we all have our physical peak. And it's all about extending the the top of the peak as high as possible and continuing the ride up to the top of that peak for as long as possible. And then when it's time to come down the other side, making sure that slope is as shallow as possible so you have the best quality yes. of life and uh, it, the best experience as possible on this planet, right? It is. And I know there's a big argument right now as to whether or not protein intake uh, can shorten lifespan. I see a lot of these longevity people barfing that nonsense up, including some very brilliant individuals like Dr. Roger Longo who actually changed his fasting protocol to include more protein and leucine in particular because he was seeing too much muscle wasting in his clients. As you get older, your demands for protein and leucine increase. Um, and the, the, the idea that you should be minimizing your protein, particularly in your older age, uh, is, is complete nonsense. There's not a single human study that supports that. They do these studies on mice and birds and whatever else. Uh, under no circumstances should people be decreasing their protein intake. Uh, they should actually be increasing it as they as they age, uh, um, and they should be lifting weights very consistently throughout life. Which, by the way, stimulates mTOR exercise. Is that killing you? I, I just think it's a, a ridiculous conversation these people are having over a complete lack of of uh, applicable uh, uh, research on humans. It's very myopic, isn't it? And that's, and that's kind of the, the downfall of some of these studies. They'll look at that one particular thing. They'll focus exclusively on, on that. They'll pretend that the body doesn't work at a system. They'll exclude all their other variables. They'll come to a conclusion, and then it'll lead people astray, and the press writes about it, and it's just total nonsense. So again, to your earlier point, it's um, the outcome is what's important. The theory is interesting, and causation is interesting, but the outcome is, is what we're after here. And look, I'm not encouraging anybody to be a power lifter or a bodybuilder or to be 250 pounds when they're 54 years old. I've never said that. This is my personal preference. This is the pursuit that, that I've been passionate about since I was a teenager. Uh, but the idea that you shouldn't maximize your genetic potential at every age as you progress by getting sufficient protein and continuing to lift weights, preferentially over almost any other uh, exercise, uh, is, uh, is certainly something that, that uh, has fortunately is gaining popularity um, with uh, with even amongst medical doctors now. You see a lot of those folks popping up talking about lifting. Yep, yep. We've got a franchise owner in Tulsa who's a, a big, strong guy and a surgeon. And our Dallas guy is a, he's a surgeon too. So the the medical community is coming around. We are slowly chipping away at at changing the old paradigm and, and letting people know that there is, for example, lifting weights is not bad for your joints, provided that you do it correctly. Um, so Stan, I better, I better stop asking you questions here, man, because otherwise I'll, I'll suck up your whole day. I could do this for hours. Um, Thank you, I, brother. I enjoy yeah. it. I'm still passionate about it all these many years later. Sometimes I, I, I talk too much, but I, I still do seminars. I've done over 200 seminars in 14 countries in all 50 states. And I, I just love talking about it. And uh, you mentioned training. I, you know, I, obviously I have my nationwide meal prep company at theverticaldiet.com. I do, a, I have my ebook and my published book at Barnes and Noble, my ebook Vertical Diet 3.0 uh, that I promote and sell. And I'm writing The Vertical Kids, uh, which is going to be a, a, a comprehensive program for maximizing your kids' genetic potential. And then I do online coaching and uh, I still take clients. I've been doing that since college. I worked in a gym in college and I've worked, uh, you know, owned gyms and trained people all my life. Uh, I think it, it keeps my, uh, it keeps my, uh, my skills, hones my skills and keeps me sharp uh, to deal with everyday folks from a broad range from obviously I'm working with John Jones, uh, the UFC light heavyweight champion that's moved up to heavyweight uh, and a lot of professional athletes, but the vast majority of my clients are dad bods and soccer moms, folks that are into their forties and fifties now who are starting to feel uh, they're sick and tired of being sick and tired. And, uh, I, you know, I help them through that journey uh, with a lot of what we talked about today. So, so yeah, I still make myself available. That's what I do full time is quote unquote, the vertical diet between meal prep and eBooks and seminars and online coaching. Uh, I, I just love it. I, like you say, I get to, I get to help people and it's extremely rewarding. Um, yeah. Stan, this was an excellent conversation. Thank you very much for the time and for sharing your knowledge. Um, where can people find you online? So you've got a YouTube channel, Stan Efferdeen. What's your Instagram handle and where else do you want people to find you? 
Yeah, everything's Stan Efforting. My website's StanEfforting.com. My Instagram is at Stan Efforting. My YouTube is Stan Efforting. So you'll find out everything there and uh, all my books. I have a ebooks for uh, building a career in the fitness industry, how our trainers are making six figures doing personal training, one-on-one, well, not one-on-one, but, uh, you know, real trainers working out of real gyms, training real clients. They do more, more uh, they do multiple clients at once, but, uh, and then we have a fast, faster, fastest book for uh, teaching how to get people faster with the overspeed training. I've been training collegiate sprinters since uh, back in the early nineties at the university of Oregon and uh, strong, stronger, strongest, which is uh, a lot of the principles that I learned from uh, powerlifting over the years. And then uh, the vertical diet 3.0, which is all the comprehensive stuff that you and I discussed today. Excellent. We'll stand on behalf of all the people that you've helped. Thank you. You're doing great work. Keep it up. Thanks, brother. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Thanks.